Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Flamingo Sundays podcast. Joined today by uh, a very, very special guest who's flown all the way from LA just for the podcast, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna say. <laughs> then made f- three uh, flights I- inside of Australia to be here. Toby Pierce, mate, thanks for being here. No, thanks for having me on the podcast, mate. In, in the uh, the makeshift studio in Paddington as well. So we, we brought out do all, what you do, all the straws, exactly. Um, mate, we're having a really good chat prior to, to, mm. to jumping on. I think we, we covered a lot of ground, but... Um, I think for the majority of listeners um, who maybe aren't tied up into the business world and, and super interested in that, you're someone who's been behind this mega business and mega brand mm. um, and you're the mastermind. And I'm not sure, do you know who Alex Hormozzi is? Have you ever seen him online? Yeah, none of the name. Yeah. In the US, like you remind me of an Australian version of him so much, <laughs> just like this mastermind of business. And I remember first hearing you on one of Mark Boris's podcasts mm. and mate, ever since I've just followed all your content. So um, yeah, cool. honored to have you on. Mate, run us through the the young years before you were this mega success and <laughs> globetrotter. Well, basically, it's the complete opposite of everything that happened <laughs> after that. Uh, small town kid, primary school, had like 30 students, like really small uh, at some point. Um, I was your really kind of small skinny music nerd that was that was me in high school uh, dj or like no nah, piano man like yeah, classical right. classical romanticism period music like that was my that was my thing um and yeah i i ended up kind of like leaving home pretty young like i left home about 16 um uh and you know for a variety of reasons ended up kind of like bouncing around to a few different jobs to try to you know make make, make ends meet um i got expelled from high school uh once nearly twice uh not for any reason other than just being silly um you know not showing up to class and all that sort of stuff um the traditional education system didn't really um i like to say it didn't really match my personality yeah, probably a more mature way of saying that was that i was a bit of a rat bag um and probably didn't respect you know the the opportunity that was in front of me um but yeah, it's, at some point in time, I, so I was working in a music shop selling pianos and, and sheet music and uh, I was uh, at university after having sat some tests to get in doing a double, double degree in law and commerce, uh, which uh, loved the topic. I was just saying to you before, I was like, some people are passionate about sport or food or travel or whatever, and that's their thing. Like I've always been passionate about business. Like that's, that's my thing. Um, so I was like loving, you know, like the concepts and the course content or whatever, but like hated the traditional education system. You know, I just couldn't sit through a lecture to kind of save myself. Um, and anyway, I was doing that part time because I had to work cause I'd already kind of like mostly moved out of home and, and done all that sort of stuff. And so eventually got to a point where I was like, well, I'm not doing university for 10 years like that. Cause if I had taken that path, I would have just been finishing university now for a double degree, right? For a double degree. Right. Yeah. yeah so all of that to then finish and potentially not even have like a job, you know, or, or, or a decent job, however you kind of, you know, define decent. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, at this point I sort of just started working out in the gym, liked fitness a bit and was like, oh yeah, everyone's sort of doing a personal training course. So like I'll do one of those, you know, I'm pretty interested in it. Triple um, degree now, right? Yeah, apparently. Yeah. And anyway, I, I looked at that and was like, oh, like it's a big convenience play. You know, I can control my own work hours. So do the course, whatever it was, I think it was like 10 weeks or something, you know, back then, it's probably 12 weeks now. Um, but yeah, I did, did my, did my course and, you know, passed that and whatever, and then started working in the gym. And that was kind of like the, that was me before, you know, the official beginning of the journey. When you say you were obsessed with business and, and obviously mm. you went through school and, and mm. jumped into commerce because you love yep. business, did that come from coming from a family that was super business orientated or? No, nah, not at all. So, uh, my, um, like we had a pretty, uh, I don't know what, right, not not to be like derogatory, but a pretty basic, you know, family, like just sort of typical Australian family. And my mum was a nurse, you know, and, and, and did some other bits and bobs, you know, around the hospital. Um, and my dad, um, you know, worked for the government, you know, for a while, ended up kind of not really enjoying that. And then later in life ended up like, you know, um, working and helping out at wineries and, you know, driving people around for wine tours. It was just not really like, not bad, but not definitely not like an international enterprise. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think like we, we, you know, we had a, like my sister and I, like we had a decent childhood. Like it was not like bad or anything like that from a financial perspective, but at the same time, it, you know, we didn't have access to like the best things or everything mm. that we wanted or needed. It was quite, you know, measured and balanced, I think so. And it doesn't sound like you went to a private school where you were surrounded by a business mogul ch- children. <laughs> well, so early in my high school years, I went to a school that's technically a private school, but it's sort of 
like at the lower end of the private schools um, in, this South is in Australia. Adelaide? Yeah, in yep. South Australia, um, which I then got expelled from, um, which my parents were obviously thrilled about uh, <laughs> uh, at the time. Um, uh, and then after that, I ended up going to a couple of public schools, uh, both of which uh, I went to. So I moved to another school and I was there for about a year. I uh, didn't have great success. And then at the same time I was there, I'd recently done some like music performances and one of the principals of another school had seen me and said, oh, why don't you come here instead? And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. That seems better. Um, and this was for piano. Yeah, yeah. So you were pretty piano. good. Uh, I, I, I went all right, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think, and that was, I think, to be honest, that was probably one of my problems in school. Like I was doing, you know, music, like I was studying music theory and, and, you know, uh, piano performance probably at a master's or PhD, PhD degree level when I was in year eight. Pretty good. Okay. So like when I, and I don't say that to be, <laughs> Subtle, to be a douche, subtly but pretty like, good. <laughs> but like it just, the, the issue for me was that, you know, then I go to like two, three, four music classes a week at school and be like, you know, like... I understand why we're doing this, but I did this when I was like nine. So yeah, you probably and, knew more than the teachers knew. Uh, maybe in, <laughs> Could in, have. In, in some circumstance, but <laughs> at the end of the day, like that's not a great attitude to have anyway, but yeah. I, I definitely found myself being, uh, you know, probably a little understimulated, um, which I think, you know, later in life, we all kind of realize that's probably just a bit of an excuse for discipline as well. Mm. But, but, um, at the time, you know, being like a teenager, you just don't really, you don't really know. Yeah. So. And, and reflecting back now, Obviously, you've had a, a huge amount of success, but would you change anything with school? Like, would you implement yourself more in class? Would you try and network? Like, yeah, I think, I, I think the thing for me that I, you know, I, I probably would change. I mean, like, in, in, in one answer to that question is like, well, now nah, everything seemed to turn out okay. You know, so like, just kind of let it be. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, there's certainly other areas of study that I wish I, you know, kind of had engaged in more um you know like computer science or physics like that sort of stuff like that like really interests me now but i'm like way too far behind to ever like meaningfully use it at least in the short term like it's a 10-year journey to kind of you know even understand the foundations there right so yeah. um but my main issue for that was yeah basically being bored and also i think like the education system generally speaking doesn't do the greatest job of contextualizing why like mm. why are you learning this you know like when we're doing geometry like i'm like awesome like that's mathematically how to draw a circle like what does that mean <laughs> yeah but if but if someone said to me it's like oh well you know if you want to you know build a game you know and you want to have a button that's a circle you have to create that circle if you're going to program that button you have to know the math to you know draw a circle but oh well that, yeah sure no worries like that would have been great for me yeah right um, it's interesting it's very true isn't it it's yeah very 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 uh rarely do we know the reason the learning. Yeah. And yeah, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, the education system is incentivized by providing foundational knowledge to a broad group of people. It doesn't, it's not necessarily perfected at all. We all know that. And it's definitely not also designed to cater for people that are at either ends of the extreme end of the spectrum. It's mm. kind of the general, you know, the general application of knowledge, right? So, which whether that's right or wrong is a conversation for an alternative time, right? That's right. That's a six hour podcast. Yeah, itself. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you, you obviously finished school. You, you did well enough to be able to get into university. So No, uh, so I, I almost failed year 12. <laughs> um, so I got a perfect score for music, which means I did really badly and everything else. Right. Um, uh, like I think my, uh, it was called, it was called the TER at the time. I think it was tertiary education rate or something, whatever it was. Can't even remember. That's how bad I was, but I, I think I scored like 54 right. or 55 out of a hundred. So, and a lot of that was made up with music. 20 points of that was made up with music. So, <laughs> so I think, um, I, I definitely didn't do great, uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, largely non-attendance and not you know, showing up to mm. exams wasn't, wasn't the best idea. But so in order to get into university, I had to sit, uh, I think it's called the stat test, which is basically like an aptitudes test to determine that if you're going to do something and you didn't get a great score, like, are you actually even going to be able to kind of do, you know, do the course. <laughs> um, and I, I did fine in that, you know, and then was able to, was able to go through and, and do what I did. But even then at university, so like I, cause I'd started my personal training business, you know, um, shortly after kind of properly kicking off university and, um, you know, I'm sitting there like, you know, in lectures around like, oh, like this is how to input a number into a spreadsheet. And I'm like, why am I paying like 20 or 30K a year to learn how to use a spreadsheet? I've been doing this since I was like 10, you know, like, because we all grew up with computers, right? Yeah, like it wasn't yeah. new to us. Again, they have to cater to everybody and, and all this sort of stuff. But so I ended up getting like quite frustrated at that, which then ended up meaning that I just put more time into my business, which ended up proving to be a good ROI. 
um, a good use of your time. Yeah. Something that we were talking about off air, which, you know, was around being a part of certain groups or mm. whatever. Mm. Um, and something that you just said then, you know, are very similar. Like it seems like you're the type of person who, when you're not tested mm. intellectually or maybe physically mm. as well, mm. you get bored very quickly. You're- yeah. Yeah. Massively. I mean, like I've got to live up to the game on the podcast. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> I guess thing, I'm out of here. <laughs> nah, look, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Right. And I, I'd argue, uh, you, at least for me and, and, you know, some people might say like, this is like neurodiversion or ADHD or, Asperger's or whatever, right? Like at the end of the day, I'm just like, cool, that's me. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. lots of people, to be honest. Like, For you sure. know, I think, you know, a lot of the modern research says you don't have ADHD or not. It's like you are somewhere on the spectrum and you have certain behavioral characteristics and traits that are present. I think for me, uh, yeah, like being stimulated or like stimulated enough was always something that I uh, struggled with, especially when there was no context. Cause I was like, cool, even if this is like moderately complex, why? Hmm. Like why, like why, why should I bother doing it? And so, yeah, when university was a little bit boring, I was like, well, I have a lot of personal incentive to get good at running my own business. Yeah. Like I, you know, cause you, to think about it this way, comparative cost benefit, right? Go to university, sit in a lecture, listen to somebody say, these are the four P's of marketing, which largely were using case studies and examples that had no relevance to the world of social media and the internet or go to a university lecture or, or tutorial to listen about how to create conditional fields and formatting and spreadsheets, which is like, you know, most of us in this generation probably did in year eight or year nine at high school. Uh, or, you know, go to work, train clients, make 130 bucks an hour, find ways to sell more sessions, you know, make 150K a year as a second year uni student. I was feeling pretty happy about that. <laughs> That's right. You know, uh, Marketing and sales 101. Yeah, and, and, and the feedback loop, right? You know, like go to a, go to a tutor read a book, you know, have a debate and the debates are largely flawed, but you know, have a debate about marketing mm. theoretically, conceptually, or two hours later, you know, design an email, send out an email to your newsletter group and see if you sell any lessons. Feedback loop is real and hardcore. And the second one, you either do or don't make money. Yeah. And the first one, it's like, it's conceptual. And again, I'm not suggesting that university has no value. I totally believe that there is. I'm not suggesting that formal education in all forms has no value. I've done plenty of it. You know, I've done a lot of it, you know, throughout my career. Um, but it's, it's what, what education, when, for what purpose, uh, and in what format, you know, is it consumed in, right? Um, cause at the end of the day, like we all have a limited amount of time and I talk a lot about this with the like founders that I work with, I'm like, there is no point in you generally studying business. And they're like, what? And I'm like, well, do you want to generally be good or do you want to specifically be good? You know, because at the moment you have a whole bunch of specific problems. So why don't we get good at that? And mm-hmm. then why don't we identify the problems that are going to come up in the short term? And why don't you specifically get good at that? And yes, occasionally read some broad business theory, try to enhance, you know, your own philosophy and thinking of business. But you know, if you had a ratio of it, it's like, you know, maybe 70 or 80% of your time should be spent on specific knowledge because that's going to actually add value now. And you get a feedback loop now to improve and hone your skills now. So what would be the difference between specific knowledge and general knowledge? Like what would be general business knowledge, for example? Yeah. Like, so, uh, what are you going to do day to day or use, uh, day to day forever? You know, like general theoretical knowledge, you know, like what is a business? Mm. What is the purpose of a business? What are the you know general functions of a business? Where does a business exist in a market? What's a market? What's an industry? You know, all of these kind of really big, broad conceptual terms. Yes, they're very useful to uh, help build your mental model and think and, and elevate your thinking or whatever. Um, but then if, you know, you're kind of, you know, that, that would say that's quite general. That's not specifically resolving a problem that you have immediately today, unless you're starting to be an investment analyst and you have a core, uh, a course, you know, certification or some sort of, you know, quiz coming up. Mm. Um, you know, whereas kind of going, oh, well, you know, right now, like we're running paid ads and social media and I really want to understand how to do better content. So I'm going to do like a content creation course, very specific, very acute, you know, very usable now and today. Ultimately over time, because uh, the more that you read and the more that you study, the more you realize that everything kind of has is on a spectrum between general and specific based on where you're at, what you're doing and whatever, you know, so the general business knowledge, for example, that it has said, then that's become hyper specific to me now because I'm, I'm in a position where I'm suggesting, you know, multiple times per week, I'm reading your know, investment opportunities. I'm like, cool. How do I really quickly understand what industry is this business in? What actually is the idea? What's the business model? What's the relevance? What's the maturity of the industry? These are all, you know, general, you know, um, approaches to business analysis, right? 
But for a person who's in a business running one, that would be considered general. So it's mm. all context based, no different to what I said before. Yeah, that mm. makes sense. And and when you went and did the double degree in law and commerce, mm. quite different uh, different courses, mm. I'm assuming. Mm. But you you know probably yeah. have played a part in uh, yeah. what you needed to know when you you made the exit. Did you go into that knowing what you wanted to become at the end of it or knowing that you no wanted idea. to? No, I let you no idea at all. And just to be clear, <laughs> I dropped out, so I didn't finish. Yeah. So I, I have no quali- well, no qualifications from uni. Um, uh, but no, so I basically went into that being like, cool. So generally speaking, I want to be good at business. I want to be involved in business, understanding commerce um, and law are going to be, you know, some significant kind of parts of that. Mm. Um, uh, but you know, it, it's really hard to say, like, did any of that knowledge help or not? Like, you just don't know. Like, it's hard yeah. to say, oh, well, this one chapter I read in this book in 2012. <laughs> How you long know, did, like, you, did you did you last before you <sighs> dropped out? It was a five and a half year full-time double degree, and I lasted three and a half or okay, three, so three, more, three and a half. more than half. Yeah, um, I think. I don't know. That's, that's, my, that's my recollection. That could be wrong. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it was good to kind of give me a taste and flavor of certain things. But if anything, you know, like, uh, one of the kind of resounding overarching learnings that came off the back of that and then my experience early on you know, actually being in business as opposed to studying business you know was that there's plenty of people with degrees heaps plenty of people who have masters or even phds in certain topics there is not a lot of data to support that there's a strong relationship between having a certification and having actual capability and competence in a particular subject mm. I mean, how many people have PT courses? How many good PTs? Yeah. How many people have MBAs? How many are great business people? It's very true. Yeah. Not, not a, there's not a strong relationship. You know, I'd suggest the more interesting data would be how many people are great business people that don't have MBAs? The majority, right? You would have thought, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and again, so this kind of comes back to like, you know, the, the debate between specific knowledge, you know, in the case by case context, you know, oriented fashion or you know, general knowledge. And even if you have general knowledge, general knowledge and general application are two fundamentally different things. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I'd hate to go and um, have surgery for someone who, d- who didn't finish their degree. Right. But yeah. you never know. I don't think that's been tested. There could be some very talented people out there who are, you know, pretty smart. Yeah. Know Look, the body that, that well, and they could probably do a surgery. I think what, one thing to accept, and this is a very scary thing to accept, right? One thing to accept is that we accept that we're all humans, obviously. And we accept that as a result of us all being humans, that we all individually exist somewhere on a spectrum between being very bad and very good at any particular skill set, right? And therefore, in any particular field, out of every 100 people, 90 of them are probably going to be terrible. That, that is just a fact of life. Like 90% of people that in any given field are probably not going to be that good. Mm. Then there's the remaining 10%. Out of the 10%, there's probably 90 of them are probably going to be, or 90% of them or nine of them will be probably okay. And there might be one person who's actually really good. And that applies to most industries and most fields. How many business people do you know that are truly exceptional at business? Not their business, at business in general. Not many. Mm. Yeah, how many times have you walked in and spoken to a GP and gone like, oh my God, you were really good and really knowledgeable? Not that many times. Yeah, how many times have you worked with a lawyer or an accountant and has been like completely blown away at how articulate they are on their subject matter and how good they are at it? Not very often. I work with hundreds of them. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, and it's commonly referred to in economics as the Pareto principle, right? You know, more results come from less of the effort, you know, just big numbers, right? You know, more often than not, things are going to be pretty average. And that's kind of sad and scary, but it's unfortunately true. It's very true. Mm. It's very true. Um, it's same with podcasting as well. Some people's podcasts are extremely go. good. Some people are below <laughs> average. Yeah. We're aiming for that bar. Um, with with doing the PT, it obviously got to a point where it was making more sense mm. to do that full time than spend a lot of your time at university. Yeah. Um, how, how did that decision come about? Was it a financial thing where you said, oh, I'm making heaps of money here, I don't really want to be in uni or was there something else that happened? Yeah, so, I mean, I would articulate it this way now but I would not have been this articulate you know, at the point in time. But you know, effectively, every decision that you make in business and, and in life in some regards is an investment decision. And by virtue of that, it means that you invest some form of resource, you expect some sort of return. And the resource that you put into that particular investment can't be put elsewhere, which means that the cost of making decision A means you can't make decision B or opportunity cost, right? Mm. That's relevant because there was a particular point in time and I can't remember the exact point in time, but there was a particular point in time. And I think it was, 
shortly we'd after you know we kind of go on live with the ebooks and whatever we might have been five or ten mil deep you know into building the business and i was still doing some one-on-one personal training still doing a double degree barely you know uh also running the boot camp bit like franchises that i set up um and doing the ebooks and so for me from a cost benefit perspective i was like i can go back to university whenever i want theoretically hopefully right don't know if i will but theoretically could have right but the opportunity to make tens or hundreds of millions of dollars may not always be here. Mm. Yeah. And so for me, like it was a, it was kind of a no brainer. I actually ended up going, get rid of uni, get rid of one-on-one PT, hire somebody to run the, the franchise business and then go full time into the online world. And that would have been probably like mid 2014 or like early 2014. And did you make that all of those decisions at once or yeah. was the first decision just not to go back no, to no, 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 all at once. Yeah. yeah, right. And was that like a master plan or something? Because one thing I noticed you said there, and I get caught up in this all the time, is you were doing five mm. things at once, right? Mm. So you put a little bit of sprinkle on that, you put yeah. a little bit of a sprinkle on that. Yeah. And then you made the decision to just go flat out into one of them and, and yeah. you know, get someone else to do those other things. Yeah, like I, no, normally, and this has just been my experience, right? Like normally if you have a question or you're questioning like multiple things like that have a similar you know, theme that run across them. In other words, I don't have enough time to do all of these things. Yeah. What am I going to do? Normally, normally the answer again is kind of, it's like, well, do the good thing and then kind of scrap everything else. Mm. Yeah. As opposed to like, well, maybe I do a little bit of the good thing and a little bit of the medium thing, a little bit of the average thing, and then a little bit of the shit thing. It's like, Oh, just get rid of the shit thing. It's like, you know, there's one of the, um, you know, one of the risks like investing is concentration risk, right? Don't put everything into one thing. When it comes to like running and building your own business, it's almost the other way around. It's lack of concentration risk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're like, oh, I've got three businesses, I've got a cafe, I've got a gym, and I got this, I'll give 30% of my time to each, or I'll give like 50 to this one and 25 to each of those two. It's like, you're not really in any of them. Yeah. And if, you're, if your goal is, and this is my opinion, you know, not a rule or a principle in my opinion, if your goal is to actually build something exceptional and you want to maximize your return from it, then you have to maximize your input to it, you know, like, cause there's so much detail and nuance in everything in every business, no matter what it is, there's so much detail and nuance that can't be seen unless you're kind of like this close to it. Mm. Um, in the same way that if you're this close to it, you kind of can't see all the long term, you know, big picture either. Right. So, so would you believe in specialization over diversification in certain things? Well, so the notion of specialization is agnostic of the consideration of time, right? So in other words, like I'm going to specialize. This is a binary closed statement. That is my thing I would do as opposed to focus, which is the reason why I chose that word, you know, because focus is dynamic, malleable and movable. So you can say, I'm going to exert all of my focus for this point in time on that topic, mm-hmm. as opposed to I am going to specialize in that. They're two subtly different, but yeah, fundamentally yeah. different, you know, statements. So I, to, to kind of reword what you said, I'd say I would for a point in time allocate all of my focus to specializing in something if I needed to. And then the exact moment that I did not anymore need to specialize in it, I would move my focus to specialize elsewhere. Right. Because it's well articulated account accounting for the dimension of time, basically. Right. So you uh, you chose to specialize or, or put your focus mm. into the online business. Mm. Was that, uh, I guess, did you d- rephrase that question? Did you do that because you could foresee the horizon of of that business, or was that growing at a much faster rate than yeah, the like, PT and, and the other stuff was happening? Yeah, so I can't remember exact numbers. Yeah, but I, I would have been making like high six, seven figures, like low seven figures or whatever, you know, um, from like franchises, one on one PTing, and some other consulting stuff I was doing at the time. Um, you know, so let, let's put that in perspective. Let's say you were doing seven or eight hundred k a year, doing seventy k a month, right? The first day that we launched the books, we made seventy grand. Mm. one day you know less than three months later we were doing 100k weeks like so you know we were like the the sh- the numbers the sheer numbers just it, it there was not there was not a lot of logic or rationale to support not doing it basically again i wouldn't have been like that articulate or disciplined about it at the time i would have just been like oh you know shit this feels like maybe i should be here you know <laughs> it's like in, in hindsight and i always refer to this like hindsight bias or reflection bias right it's like you're always going to reflect on things many years ago based on your current understanding of the world you it's really hard to reflect on or oh, well, what happened 10 years ago based on how i thought 10 years ago mm, tell yeah, me your answer true. 10 years ago it's like well but i don't know my answer 10 years ago i only know what i did and i can only reason for it now yeah so 
it's hard to so it was making sense commercially that yeah you were making a lot more money essentially here yeah. than what you were here and would you say you had yeah. more of a passion for it as well like for the online space and uh well going back to one of the things you said earlier it's like it was way more stimulating yeah right. yeah like so i, I not like i always articulate it this way around my do i like health and fitness yes i keep you know i i walk a lot i lift weights a lot you know i do mobility stuff a lot i do lots of martial arts you know i train like 12 times a week so i like it i don't live for it though like i don't need it i like digital and i like internet businesses and i like technology i don't live for it i live mm. for business right so like sweat in many ways was you know an outlet you know for me uh, and uh, it provided enough stimulation for me you know first couple of years got to try to learn everything about marketing oh shit we're gonna build a software company shit got to learn about software now <laughs> you know it's like oh okay hold on we've got all this stuff now got to learn about people management and operations oh, yeah like so yeah <laughs> yeah so it, it it was an amazing vessel to provide in some regards almost like an overwhelming amount of stimulation and need for learning um which like now being on the other side you know i work with founders and whatever and i'm like oh my god it's so hard like i'm watching them and i'm like this is so hard for them it's so challenging for them and i'm like i i can't even really i can't really remember what that was like like to me all i remember is being like hell yeah like i'm learning a lot this is awesome and like i thrived off that but the more that i'm in the seat i'm in now the more i realize like that's actually quite challenging for a lot of people it can be quite overwhelming so how did you go from because obviously pt is like client services mm. right you're training mm. people every day mm. it's client facing mm. to then um you know the 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 internet stuff you obviously built the first mm. thing you built was the like the ebooks right where you, yeah. you bought them online yep. it was like fitness program yep. essentially yeah how did you go from that to that because obviously where our, our business is fully yeah you know client client yep. facing and yeah i interview a lot of people who sit on, on those yep. chairs yeah and none of them have built exceptional businesses being client <laughs> servicing but, you know, there's, there's always something to do with tech or, but yeah. they always start off like that. So I had a, a guy, Frank Grief, who's a good friend of mine. He mm. he started out building a company that installed real estate signs mm -hmm. and later sold his company to Domain for $200 million. Yeah. But it was a, a tech-based company, but it just transitioned through that. Yeah. How, yeah. how, how do you do that? This is a selfish question. Well, so <laughs> uh, I'll talk you through the thinking in a second, right? Yeah. But, you know, most, most, uh, yeah, most like kind of skyrocket growth stories you hear about, regardless of the industry that they're in, like forget the industry or forget all of that, right? Real estate, tech, whatever, right? Most of them come uh, about as a result of innovations in business model, right? So, yeah, let's let's have a look at uh, Facebook, right? You know, so Facebook is an advertising platform, technically, right? Mm -hmm. Amongst other things well what was the previous version of that business model well it was radio and it was television and it was you know print media effectively right so these guys you know built a market people came you know, and they connected you know content uh, people with content and then they charged you know businesses for the right to be seen there effectively right um cool but you know tv is limited by an area print media is limited by print circulation you know radio is limited by listeners okay cool 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 well Facebook uh, effectively innovated the you know business model of content consumption by saying, well, we'll get other people to create their own content and connect and engage in their own content. So they 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 innovated the supply issue, right? So when I say supply, I mean you know print media's supply, right? Is you know how many eyeballs can we supply to the advertiser, right? That sounds a little back to front, but it's. I can sell you 30,000 views if you buy the front page of this piece of paper. Mm. Well, right? So true what you were just saying. I was, I was looking at the ground like thinking like, oh, yeah. this guy's So Facebook innovated that, right? What did Uber do? Well, previously, you call taxi company, a whole bunch of taxi franchises. Taxi franchises have a distant at arm's length relationship with taxi drivers. No real quality tr control, no real care or concern or anything. That's, that's the business model, right? And there's a whole bunch of shit to do with plates and this and that and the other. Well, what's Uber do? Uber go, oh, well, we'll just create a marketplace. Got a whole bunch of people who want to get taken places, riders. Got a whole bunch of people who can drive, drivers. Innovated the supply by saying, well, you don't have to have a three to $600,000 license plate. You don't need to work for this person. Start and stop whenever you finish. You can be anybody. Mm -hmm. And then for the customers, they innovate it by saying, well, it's like use an app, order the app. We'll come to you. Uh, there's all these great features. And people get confused. They're like, oh, it's the features. It's like, no, it's the innovation of the business model that works right? Like Airbnb, 
same thing. Yeah, you, know, you can go through like so many of these examples, right? You know, like why why do some companies uh you know who are manufacturing like your know, goods like e-commerce goods or whatever, why do they win? Well they innovate supply. They find a way to manufacture cheaper. Why do drop shipping work? Innovating freight. <laughs> like you can go through this, like you yeah, literally yeah. if you take the same concept and idea, most businesses that achieve outpace growth and that are large and go on to have, you know, really, really, really big achievement are innovating an industry via its business model, right? Like Uber Eats, I mean, it's a subsidiary of Uber, obviously, same thing. Like we could be here for ages talking yeah. about that, Let's right? Let's unpack real estate. It's a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so, you know, like relating this to, you know, back to what we were doing at Sweat. So how, how do we get to eBooks, right? So I've been training in a gym, working with clients, had some boot camps, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, you know, people kind of go, oh, well, like, you know, when we do sessions, you seem to know all about blah. Can you help me with like an exercise plan to do outside of lessons? Or can you give me some meal ideas or like, you know, constant on like how to understand eating healthier, right? And I was like, well, no. And then like months later, I was like, yes. Um, you know, so then did Why that. no to begin with? Well, it's just a lot of effort. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> I was like, it's like what, am, what am I going to make from this? Like, you know, yeah, I've got like, at some points, like you know, I've got 60 clients or whatever. It's like 60 people times 50 bucks not really like not really punching the lights out yeah, in terms yeah. of ROI. <clears throat> so as we went through that, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, look, screw it, I'll do it anyway. Ended up like getting some work, doing some consulting for like larger corporates and they kind of said the same thing. And I was like, oh, people seem to want this. Then running the boot camps, there's a whole bunch more people, a few hundred clients. And they're like, I was like, oh, maybe we're getting to the point where this is feasible. And then had been using social media at the time, you know, to kind of promote uh, yeah, you know, Kayla's business or, uh, like Peting, you know, in her kind of, you know, studio or, you know, my, my personal training courses or whatever. And, uh, long story short, it was like, Oh, I want to train with you. Like I live in Sydney or I want to train with you. I live in Russia or <laughs> wherever. Like it was, you know, and at this point in time, I was just like, what, like, what even, like, what country is that? Like, hadn't even heard about it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to expand the boot camp franchises. That doesn't really make sense. I can't control the quality. Let's just see if people have some interest in the books, train the way that we do you know, think the way that we do about fitness and let's, let's see if that's what you want to do. You know, built them and people loved it basically. And I think it was like 20 grand to set up the business initially. Like it was like really small, like, you know, wrote the books, took all the photos, terrible photos, you know, all that sort of like junk. That, that was effectively how we got to eBooks and you know, how did we get to the Apple? It felt like a, another series of pretty logical steps, although we were many years ahead of other people. That's it felt like logical steps. Right. And with the eBooks, like, did you write all of the content mm -hmm. or did you get someone to do it? So you did everything? No, yourself, I did it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. So it would have been time consuming. But... Yeah, well, and, uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly what the first versions were. There were a couple of hundred pages. Like yeah. it was pretty like but a pretty decent amount of work, content. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and we iterated them over time and improved them over time and got more sophisticated and compliant and all this sort of stuff. But I mean, because you never, no one's first version is ever any good. Of course. And <laughs> but, would you say you're a perfectionist on that? Because I think, you know, like to bring that to market, and it not necessarily mm. be perfect or the first iteration as you said yeah. were you like fuck it's not re it's not ready yet i need to um i'd say like generally speaking i did struggle with some perfectionism you know throughout my journey at sweat and with other businesses that i, I own and i'm involved with i think interestingly at that point in time i didn't actually really care that much if it succeeded like and this is so <laughs> um it and when I say that, it's like, I didn't really care because I was like, I don't really know if it will. It's like, if it does, it does. I spent right. 20 grand. I had a crack. Like I shot for the moon type scenario. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If it does, awesome. Yeah. And were you seeing it as like another, you know, bolt on to the personal training? Pretty business? much. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I Initially, I didn't kind of go, oh, this is the next big thing. Mm. I was just like, oh, this might contribute. Maybe I can grow the business. Yeah. You know? um, it wasn't until later that I figured out that, you know, that it'd be a pretty, a pretty big deal. And I think in relation to the whole, uh, you know, did I want to perfect it thing or like, was I afraid to, you know, launch it or whatever, you know, um, like at the time or, you know, that's something I said quite recently, actually, like I said, I didn't realize that I didn't really care if it was going to work or not because I didn't really know much about it. One of the things I see people facing to now, whether they are wanting to launch a business or whether they are, have already launched a business and they're thinking about the next thing or how to grow or what, whatever it is. Yeah, you know, is this like really big kind of like fear of failure? And I said this a couple of times recently, and it's a little blunt, it's a little savage, but it's like if you have never done it before and you don't really know anything about it and you have no knowledge experience in it and you haven't really spoken to anyone who has specific knowledge experience in it, for you to assume that you will fail or be worried about failure is in some ways almost arrogant because you think that you know more about something 
about a topic or an activity that you've never actually even engaged in. It's no different to a person sitting at home on a couch watching the UFC you know, and someone's going, just stand up, just knock him out, who's never <laughs> been in a fight their whole life. Like it, it is actually fundamentally no different. You have no knowledge or experience at all when you're instructing or making decisions on behalf of somebody else or yourself yeah. when you have no data whatsoever to support that that's actually a feasible statement. Like, so for people who like get stuck in that position, I'm like, well, let's do it this way. Either do it and accept that you might win or lose or don't do it, but accept that you chose not to do it and move on. Because like sitting in La La Land isn't really productive for anybody. Mm. So in short, you you had perfectionism, but you, you chose to overcome that yeah. because yeah. you didn't want to... The perfectionism La La got Land. worse. Yeah, it got much worse actually over time because right. as things got better and opportunities got bigger, my fear of not you know consuming the opportunities got worse. And that, you know, one of the ways that manifested was, well, we have to do things better. It has to be perfect. You know, like I literally remember like looking multiple times at our app or whatever. And I'm like, that pink's different to that pink. And people are like, no, it's not. And I'm like, test it. And like, shit, it is. You know, like I just wouldn't release things if I didn't think that the colors were perfect or the font was perfect or <laughs> wow. it wasn't centered or the padding was wrong or right or the orientation was flawed or whatever. Like, and more often than not, anything I was saying had actually no true value at all. <laughs> like was whatsoever. subjective to what Entirely you subjective and entirely yeah. emotional. Um, yeah, which is... A harsh reflection to have on yourself but um but that's that's kind of the reality of it you know to be objective of myself yeah of course and 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 how did it then go from fitness plans and and um you know like the the online stuff to then transitioning mm. that into an app and yeah in essence a, a mega business that yeah so the like at the point in time if you asked me that question i would have just said i'm like oh this seems quite logical and, and that was i was this was kind of like my first real foray into strategic planning or making a strategy very simplistically speaking um because i was looking at this being like oh this is a multifactorial problem but i had access to all of the data and perspective required to make the decision so when people asked me they were asking me from a position of not really understanding so i would look at this and be like okay well we sell ebooks we're making lots of money here we could do more really we're selling a book with photos videos would be better we get feedback the videos would be better Really, we're selling an ebook that anyone can send, so there's a big security issue here. Really, we're selling a myopic form of content that isn't actually suitable to a whole audience, so we need to create something that's suitable to a whole audience. Uh, you know, really, we're asking for a lot of money from young people, you know, 100 bucks or whatever for content. Like, why don't we put in a subscription and make it cheaper? You know, really, we should probably make it an app because that's going to be the next big thing. Yeah, you know, and so there's all these like kind of obvious reflections and whilst they were obvious at least to me whilst they were obvious and whilst they were logical and whatever um there was not a lot of logic in trying to build a technology company with no prior experience mm. and no like no technical co-founder or technical supporter advisor you know at the time and um, which ended up like the biggest problem that we had was not actually is this a good idea it was like how the hell do we actually bring it to life um which you know, i ended up you know um in all of my uh you know, naivety and glory at the time ended up entirely destroying the company the first time that we tried to do that. Um, it worked out later, obviously. Um, but, you know, the way in initially was incredibly uncomfortable. How how did it uh, not go to plan initially? Oh, uh, you know, massively over-invested <laughs> on building the first version of the product. You know, got into this kind of like, you know, the build trap, you know, build these features because people say they want them. But wanting a feature and using a feature are fundamentally different. You know, mm. wanting a feature and a feature adding value are fundamentally different. Um yeah, you know, so I invested a lot of money in that. It didn't make sense. You know, didn't really understand the notion of like tech debt and long-term strategic, uh, you know, technology planning. So I wasted a lot of money building stuff that had to be rebuilt, you know, months or, or quarters later. Um, didn't really plan, you know, didn't really kind of govern and control quality assurance and quality control of the tech. So we had lots of bugs, pricing research. You know, like so much stuff. Like we literally went into this, went into this basically being like, well, our product works well now. Imagine how good it'll be in an app. Let's build it like just thought you could sit on the lounge and just type a bit of code up and like yeah, you did yeah. with the original so, books. something like that um so yeah we made like almost every mistake under the sun as far as i'm aware and concerned at the time um but you yeah, know again kind of coming back to uh, one of the remarks earlier i think that was just enough stimulus to keep me really motivated to try to you know to try to like fix all those things and work through it and th that took years you know this yeah. was a multi-year project but um yeah good fun good fun at the time and and when did you again like go from because you obviously went from being a pt to mm. selling the the courses yeah. and that then you know become the big thing and the pt yeah. fell away yeah. when did the, the the courses become the the second thing to to the app was it a fast process where everyone transitioned yeah. from buying the yeah so basically overnight um, wow. which was another really big failure on my part you know we should have probably done a soft launch um 
but it was it was a hard launch. It was like, hi, this is here. Forget everything else. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, we ended up like you know in brackets, kind of losing like you know over uh, I think it was a million and a half or two million bucks or something. Yeah. You know, at, at that point in time, in the month of launch, because no one would have kept. You know, yeah. It was, and that would have been a much higher ticket as well. Correct. So yeah, and then hundred dollars to ten dollars. Yeah, yep. and then you know we didn't properly understand the subscription business model, so we're like, oh, cool, we got all these customers; they'll stay forever. When they get one month in, I'm like, half of them left. Yeah, you know, like so. There's all these things that um, you don't understand, and as well, like to add even more flavor to that, like you know, do you think that any of the data that you can get now from Apple or Google's ecosystem and subscription didn't exist then? Like yeah, right. the, the notion of being able to have a repeating bill in Apple in 2015 was like new. So how did people renew? It like literally it had just come out like yeah, we, were, right. we were some we were some of the first companies of doing it you couldn't and like um and this is getting a little bit like technical but you couldn't even do um you know a manual call on their api or webhook to determine if the receipt was still valid you just had to wait until the end of next month to see if, if you got paid like it was so like it was so like so at the beginning like so much at the beginning of like what was happening you know right. like there's so much like great support and technology that exists now that just didn't exist then yeah and that was 2015 mm. and November 22nd, 2015, we launched. Yeah. And then six years later, 2021, the exit Yeah, was? 2021, old June 30. Yeah. And was that always the plan to, to build to exit? Yeah. So I would say that was always the plan and I had no idea what that meant. You know, like, so uh, like, as in why did we build the app? Yes, it was all those reasons, but the app was, so the app was initially called sweat with Kayla because we always knew it would become sweat and we always doing the app to become sweat because we knew that we needed to have more trainers and content partners so that we didn't have key man risk with Kayla or key talent risk if you, if yeah, you will right. yeah, yeah. so that that was one of the big strategic pillars that kind of just operated in the background again wouldn't have been articulated that clearly but that that's effectively mm. what was happening um because the plan was always always to sell and that was basically because been to America a few times, met some VCs, you know, met some tech founders. I was like, hurrah, yeah, we'll just sell this, you know, like, <laughs> um, and obviously it, it doesn't happen like that at all. Yeah. Um, and I had, you know, some uh, very uh, character building experiences, you know, that, that kind of taught me a lot of those lessons, but it was always the direction we were striving toward. Yeah. Was to exit. Mm. And, and I mean, you obviously built this, this huge company and I said, you remind me, Alex Ormozzi, one of his mm. big things that he said when he exited out of gym launch, he's also mm. in fitness, was, you know, he the, he went from having all of this cash flow mm. on a monthly basis to all of yep. having, having no cash flow and a, yeah. a big chunk. Was, was that something that you toyed with? Was Do we keep the business and continue yeah. to grow it and have this cash flow producing machine and step away from it? Or A, a little bit, yeah. Like, I mean, the thing is, in the early days, we were growing so fast uh, and the advertising ecosystem was so different. Like, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly what the numbers were, but I think like in the first, the first year of being an app order, we probably still would have made like 10 to 12 million in EBITDA. Wow. Yeah. And like free cash flow because we weren't really doing it like capitalizing or, or any of this sort of stuff. Right. So, um, you know, we, uh, we were still like quite profitable at this point. It wasn't until and we tried to. that was in year to, one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so it wasn't until later on that we, yeah, when we tried to throttle growth harder, yeah, you know, unit economics deteriorated a little bit, market came more competitive. Um, yeah, you know, we got a little bit bloated with certain like operational overheads and costs, you know, S and W and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and that that started to kind of like squeeze, you know, OPEX goes up, you know, gross margin goes down, not a good mix, you know, like and then you know, and then at that time as well, it's like, okay, cool, let's try to sell the company now all these massive competitors raising like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars and you were completely bootstrapped yeah we never raised any wow. money yeah um which yeah like again like in reflection so like you know i founded another oh, sorry um yeah i founded another company about four or five years ago um and we've like been raising money every quarter or every six months yeah since that and like, much easier to spend other people's money on. so much easier <laughs> i mean i still own most of the company but but um it's much easier to, to do it on other people's money but uh, i mean it's a big responsibility of course um but it is much easier i think i yeah i just didn't like the idea of kind of like giving up uh, control at that point when we didn't really need to mm. um but again like you know that's a in, like i always say this to people uh, i literally all the time i'm like don't listen to a media headline or a podcast or whatever it may be and listen to that person's story and go oh, well they did it i can't so because that statement's fundamentally wrong like straight up wrong mm -hmm. like you can't like i i wouldn't be able to start sweat again now even with all of my knowledge and 50 million bucks there's no way that i would be able to start sweat again now and build exactly what i just built none and what's the what's the main reason for that oh, heaps of reasons but, you know like competition ridiculous 
you know, Apple's, uh, you know, privacy implementation and drop of the IDFA decreasing, you know, everyone's performance, but Facebook and Instagram's advertising performance, horrendous, right? Like, you know, the ability to use uh, organic social media to get, you know, above market reach and returns and impressions for low cost, like basically impossible now. I should use a TikTok. Oh, yeah, maybe even, <laughs> but, but even sustainability yeah, of that, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so like the, the culture and environment in the industry, coming back to the whole like general, you know, big picture mm. knowledge before it's this structure the structure of the fitness market is now different. It's so interesting as well. And there's a, there's a saying, it's like you can't compare your chapter one to someone else's chapter 10, right? And mm. like, I'm guilty of that. I'm sure lots of other people are guilty of looking mm. at someone else. And, Fuck, look what they've yeah. done in such a short period of time. But, yeah. You know, a lot of the time, it was so many elements that come together at the perfect oh, ab- point absolutely. in time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, yeah, and yeah, like even when you look at, um, like, let, 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 let's use like TikTok as an example, right? Why has TikTok been able to grow so fast? Like, what is the one single overarching reason they're going to grow so fast? A lot of people would go, oh, well, you know, they match the, the, the feature set and, you know, the, the consumer engagement model to society and they do it better than Facebook, you know, rah, 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 whatever. It's like, sure, but that has nothing to do with how much money they make. Nothing at all. That only mm-hmm. has to do with how they engage the end customer, which creates supply, which they can in turn sell for. But like, what, what's the key reason? It's like, well, artificial intelligence and recommendation engines basically did not exist at all in the way that they exist now when Facebook launched. And Facebook wasn't even the first to market for a social network. They were many, many, many you know, iterations behind other organizations, right? Facebook were, um, won because they used some of the playbooks from the other companies that died or were dying. Mm. TikTok has now used Facebook and Instagram's playbook to then go and build TikTok. It's, there's no, there's absolutely no surprise. And then Facebook and Instagram try to, you know, catch up, right? You know, Snapchat had different problems, you know, for, I mean, great business, but different problems for, you know, for their growth curve and whatever. Like there's no surprise that Instagram did it better than Facebook because Instagram had Facebook's playbook. It's no surprise that TikTok then did it better than Instagram because they had Instagram and Facebook's playbook. You know, like they're still in the same industry. They're still the same business model. There's a lot to be learned over time. The next one, like you couldn't now do, you couldn't launch TikTok today and then do what TikTok did. Exactly. That, yeah. like, that won't work. You know, like market timing and industry structure and rate of innovation and technological advancement and political barriers. You know, there's so many different like considerations to have, but a lot of those things, you know, one small change can massively unlock or lock you know, a door of opportunity. Yeah. And that going back to what you were saying before, um, you know, looking back in hindsight, it's easy to see those things, right? But it, I, mm. I bet you when someone found a TikTok, they didn't, you know, no. they didn't start that company going, oh, we can do X, Y, and Z. It's only that no. you look back now in hindsight and go, well, this yep. is this is why it worked. Yeah, and like you see this a lot too, you know, like the founder of Bumble, you know, like comes <clears> out of a, you know, dating platform, whatever, like has the whole playbook and finds a really intelligently identified opportunity and goes playbook, bang. But the opportunity was there. You had to see the opportunity. Mm, it's a very right? interesting story, that yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much so. But like you know, there's there's a lot here. You know, like and at the end of the day, like timing is responsible for more business success than a lot of other things. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Despite what as a lot much of as we don't say. like to say, right? Yeah, no. We, well, I, I always say this when I tell the story. Like, so I'm like, it's important to contextualize. I didn't know any of the shit I'm talking about now when I did that, and it was all complete crap and bullshit at the time. Yeah. And it somehow still worked. You know, like you could almost argue that the reason that the organization succeeded didn't even have a lot to do with me. It just had to do with a lot to do with timing and that'd make me feel not that great. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, you can't, you can't understate, you know, the value of timing. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and actually being an action taker and implementing what you were, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you, you ended up exiting out of sweat for mm. a, what was it? Four, 400? Uh, and enough enough <laughs> yeah um that's what i read allegedly yeah no look we, we were very fortunate to uh get a deal done you know that was kind of that substantial in those terms at that point in time yeah i mean even even looking at that now like if you were trying to redo a similar yeah i was gonna say that's company now, completely like, changed right the whole industry has been restructured uh, i don't even need to go over it all you know like people who have been paying attention will know that there's a lot of you know kind of uh interesting and curious changes you know even looking at i think I can't remember exactly what the stat was, so apologies to anyone listening who knows that this is inaccurate, but it was something along the lines of like 80 or 90% of the companies that did an IPO between the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2021, so that like two-year intense COVID period, something like two-thirds or more of the equity values already been wiped off the stock market. Wow. So like, you, like awesome, list, cool, great, you know, escrow period finishes, liquidate your money, bang, done. You couldn't do that six months later. Mm. You couldn't do it again 12 months later. Like there's timing and windows of opportunity uh yeah, very, very important. And hindsight again. Yeah. And then this is probably the interesting stuff for a lot of the listeners is like sell a company. How mm-hmm. old are you now? Like 
Just turned 30, yeah. So it was 28 when we sold. <laughs> yeah, that's <so> yeah. crazy. <laughs> what are you... What? So it happens, you're obviously earning huge amounts of money all the way up until mm. that point. Mm. So I'm, I'm sure your life didn't dramatically change. Mm. But when you get a sum of money like that that hits your bank account and you're not even 30 years old yet, mm. what does that do to, to an individual? Yeah, so I, I, <laughs> I sometimes relate this to you know, going out and having a party, right? And, you know, like, so you meet all the people at the beginning of a party and you kind of, like, feel out what their personalities are. You might know some of them or whatever. And then, like, by the time you get to, like, three quarters of the way to the end of the night or the end of the night or whatever, everyone's, you know, drunk or, or doing whatever they're doing, you know, having a good time. But they're two fundamentally different people a lot mm. of the time, <laughs> most of the time, That's right? That's why I don't drink. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and so I look at that and I kind of go, I think a similar thing sometimes happens with, you know, people who kind of come into money. And I would also... I would also be careful about saying like the money is one component of it because with money in some cases comes, you know, status and fame and power and influence. Mm. So it's not like got money, nothing else in my life changed for some people, not necessarily me, but for some people that changes multiple dimensions of their reality. Um, in, so kind of following that thread, you know, people who come into, you know, this newfound status or, or money or, or whatever it might be, some people it changes a lot. Some people that a lot is in a good direction. Some people it's not in such a good direction. Some people it doesn't really change them at all. Um, I think for me, you know, my experience is, you know, relevant only to me and or people that have like a similar model of, you know, uh, money as it relates to safety. So like my thing, because I left, you know, home when I was quite young, I was always like, oh, you know, money, 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 that's safety, you know, that like keeps me alive and keeps me secure. Um and then kind of on top of that, I, uh, in my sort of like, you know, late teenage years kind of then where, well, if money means safety and security, then money means comfort, you know, and money means success. So money, more money would make me a better person. And so earlier in my life, like that was, you know, probably one of the big like motivating driving factors was like more money means more security, more money means I'm a better person. You know, so like that's what I should be. That's my motivation to drive me to work hard. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, on a variety of different occasions, that was very much proven to be untrue. Um, you know, that having more money doesn't make you a better person at all. Um, as I said, some people would actually make some become terrible people. Mm. Um, and more money, it's, it's not, it's not simple enough to say that more money doesn't equal more safety. It's sort of money to a point in time relative to where you live and your needs create safety. But after that, the surplus doesn't actually create more safety. There's diminishing returns. So, you know, for me, um, you know, I remember, uh, you know, kind of doing the deal and I remember like the exact point and time where I got the message, you know, notification being like, hi, like a whole bunch of zeros have landed in your bank account. And I was like, you know, obviously, wow, rah, it's exciting, whatever. I kind of like instantly washed over with like, well, but what does that mean now? You know, and like instantly I was just like, I hadn't actually realized that for many years of my life, I'd lived with this constant stress, even though I had made, you know, a decent amount of money had tens of millions of dollars worth of other, other assets outside of this. It had never actually occurred to me that I was still afraid. So it had never, ever occurred to me that up until that exact point in time that I was still like, one day I might have no money. One day I might, you know, live on the streets again or any of this sort of shit. Like it never occurred to me that like subconsciously that was like still there. And when the money hit my bank account, I was like, huh, like just this really big, you know, kind of instant moment. Um, and yeah, and then it sat there for months and months and months and months and I didn't spend any of it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did because I didn't have a reason to, you know, because for me, uh, earlier in my life, I'd kind of come to the conclusion like material assets didn't really, didn't really do it for me. You know, people want money for different reasons. Mine was for safety and security. You know, other people want it because they want to have material assets to make them look and feel good, whatever, each to their own, no judgment, regardless of whatever it is that people want to do. But yeah, for me, it was basically a big sigh of relief and then cool life goes on. <laughs> yeah. Not really a lot changes. But uh, yeah, that's something you said there, I think and a lot of people um, realize is even when you've got a business doing huge amounts of revenue, a lot of the time your liability is in line with that revenue, mm. right? The more mm. money you make, the more staff yep. you employ, the more money yep. you spend on marketing. Yep. So I think like for someone who earns $100,000 a year mm. and aspires to earn a million, that's mm. 10 times what they earn right now, right? But when yeah. you're at a level where you might be <clears throat> doing tens of million in, in revenue, mm. your expenses are similar, and your lifestyle is similar and yep. usually the, you're at risk. So it sounds like when you had the, 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 the big chunk of money hit the bank, mm. it was a comfort to know that and all. It, it's just, it's a, it's on the fall back on, I guess. Is you one worked way out how many years it. of safety net you had now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> probably won't make it that long. 
I think like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting as well because I think a lot of people and I've had a lot of friends who have, you know, built and sold companies and some of them for much more, you know, much more money than I have. Now, a lot of people always have these like crazy ideas about what they're going to do and what they're going to buy. Uh, and I'd realized that I'd never actually thought about that. <laughs> like I never once actually thought like I'm going to buy blah, like whatever it is. It never really occurred to me. I think, um, you know, if, if anything, you know, for me, now I'm in a position where if I you know want to go out for dinner or whatever I can, if I want to fly here, I can. If I want to do whatever, I can do it comfortably. Um, but those things occur to me much less now. Like my desire, like my big desire to do any of those things really actually occurs to me much less. Because like, you can do it. Yeah, I, th- I think because yeah. I can do it and because also, yeah, there's no like, there's no sting or zing to it, you know, anymore. Um, you know, like my, uh, my partner, Rachel, like she lives interstate, so we do long distance. And, you know more often than not you'll see me flying Jetstar. Like and like I've had like people ask me or like friends of mine ask me, they're like, dude, like what does it pay for business? I'm like, Yeah, sometimes I do. Like if it's not available, I'd just rather go sooner, spend more time with her. So yeah. I'd rather sit like what like why does it matter? You know, like a seat is a seat. Like mm-hmm. guess what? You take off and land at the same time. You know, sure, I just went to America and I decided to, you know, fly in a comfy seat so I could lay down because I wanted to sleep. But you know, like I don't look at that and be like, that's a must. Like I absolutely have to have that. I'm like, I'd certainly prefer it. Yeah. It's so true as well. Like I, <clears throat> flying is one thing, right? Because every, mm. every time you're sitting in economy, yeah. b- before you could afford to fly business class or yeah. first class, mm. that's all you want to do because yeah. you, you can't do it. Yep. So when you can afford it and you can do it and you yeah. do it, you know, <laughs> I just, that was, that's always used to happen to me. I always wanted to fly a business. My, my yeah. family was never, you know, wealthy enough to be able to do it. And my mum and dad were like, what the fuck are we paying that sort of money? Yeah. Same thing, you get to the same place yeah. at the same time. Um, but then when you can afford to do it, mm. you're like, fuck, why would I do that? It's a two-hour flight. I'll just yeah. sit back there, you know? Yeah, no, it's, I totally get it, man. Like, and, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my friends and a couple of my closest friends, you know, um, uh, you know, one in particular I've been mates with for, like, you know, 20 years. Like, a lot of the time he gets, like, really angry at me because I just, like, I have, like, I, I heaps of my gym clothes have, like, holes and shit in it. <laughs> like, I just don't, it just doesn't really, it just doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Like, he always says to me, he's like, man, he's like, he's like, for someone who has the means you know, to kind of buy whatever t-shirt it is that they want. He's like, you just really do not seem to give a shit like at all. And I'm like, well, man, I'm, I'm going to go to the gym to sweat in it. Like, yeah, you know, why does it really matter? And do you think you give like, a shit l- less now than you did massively before less. it all happened? Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, when I was in the journey, like, for example, like while I was at sweats, like I wouldn't, I really wanted to fly a business class. Like I really wanted to, like, I thought that, you know, that that was like super important, mm. you know, um, now I'm on the other side, uh, you're in a financial position that is many times greater than what I otherwise was before and or thought I probably ever would be. And it just doesn't really mean as much now. Like, I think the whole, the whole notion of value, like how much do you value something or a thing, how much do you value it and how much is it worth, you know, so to speak, like is a really fascinating concept because it's entirely subjective. Yeah, price is not price is objective. You will pay X dollars for it, but how much value or priority you place in it in itself is an incredibly interesting subject. And I mean, my experience with it has been really amazing. Like as in, I've learned a lot, you know, just by observing it. But again, and, and I always kind of you know caveat this statement. Right, it's really easy for me to say that now. Like I'm on the other side of a transaction, mm. where I'm very fortunate to be in the position that I'm in. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with desiring you know, to have more and be more and own more and you might get it and you might change your mind. But like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, and I've always been, I've always been kind of like, uh, attempting to be unashamedly honest, you know, about like, you know, my perspectives, like I said before, like I wanted to win, like I would have done anything to win. Like I wanted to make money. I wanted to win. I wanted to grow. And guess what? I still want to win. Like, <laughs> I, like right now, like most of my days are spent being like, how am I going to win more? Not because I have any interest in making more money. My reasons are different now, but like I unashamedly want to win. At that point in time, more money was winning. Like, do you, um, last thing on the money thing, do you now, you know, X hundred millions, mm. do you now look at people like in the billions or like, because <laughs> there's always someone, right? They're like, always you know, you're around. looking at like from here to here and then when you get to that level, you're like, fuck, now you look at this person yeah. and you always continue to look. Is it the same now? Like, do you look at, oh. I mean, I don't know who, who Bezos or Musk looks at it. <laughs> oh, look, it's a, it's an interesting thing. Like I, I think over time, like I, I get interested about those people or that level of performance for the fact that it is performance, mm. you know, more than I kind of go like, I want to have $333 billion like Musk. Like that, that's not 
really important to me. Yeah, you but know, the like, size of the company he's built and yeah, you know, the, like for me, I, I always kind of say like impact is kind of my you know like key design now. So like I would use you know equity value or money effectively as a measuring stick. You know, mm-hmm. it's a financial measurement of success. Um, but like outside of that, it's like, you know, like Elon Musk has a lot of money. Cool. That's awesome. That's great. It's like, but look at what the guy is going to do for our civilization. Mm. Yeah. You know, like for society, for our planet, you know, for our people, like, you know, that's like, that's more than just like, oh, I sold some stuff. Yeah. Like your know, impact is huge. And a lot of people will argue that. And a lot of people will have this, that, and the other opinions about it or whatever. But, and, you know, and in 10,000 years time, he'll probably not even be remembered. Right, but in a hundred years' time or two hundred years, he will because he did some things that were really important, and you kind of can't dispute that. You need to, yeah, you you need to have done those things to earn the right to have that status, right? Like I, I would personally say this: I don't have any of that. Like I built a company, you know, with someone and with a team of people that contributed to heaps of people's lives in a positive way. We helped a lot of people feel better about themselves and lose weight. That is a massive win for me. I am mm. super energized about that. But that doesn't even register on the scale, you know, when you're comparing to organizations like that, right? Yeah. So when I look at those things now, like, yeah, it's, it's less to do with like how much money can I make? Like, yes, the scoreboard always exists, but it's more to do with, well, what level of impact can I have with people? And this is part of the reason that I really love working with founders because, you know, I go, well, I can help them generate equity value. And by them generating equity value, they're also delivering value to end users. So I can help end users get it. So my ability to add value is actually in some regards, you know, multiplied by working with other people as opposed to me just working on one business. Yeah, that makes sense. And and for you now, like what is, like, the reality is you wouldn't have to work another day in your life. You wouldn't mm. have to do anything. Mm. Where do you derive purpose from now? Is it just from working with founders or are you still trying to work yeah. it out? It's only been a short period of time, right? No, so I think, yeah, it's, there's, there's a couple of things. Yeah, so one of them is like I, because business is such a big passion for me, generally speaking, um, you know, the idea of like working with founders, you know, I, I will help companies put together their strategy and do strategic planning days. You know, I will mentor and advise and coach founders or, or, or founder and executive teams to, you know, kind of get the business to the next level. Like I, it is hard for me to articulate how energizing that is. Like, I love that stuff. Like, um, a lot of clients, a lot of my clients tell me they're like, oh man, like you just like, you just look so happy when you're talking about what you're talking about. And so I really love that. That's kind of one component. Um, another component is I spend a lot of time, um, you know, kind of like writing and documenting my journey and, you know, like my philosophy on business. I have no idea what I want to do with that. Um, if anything, I'm probably debating whether or not I should, you know, kind of make that, you know, publicly available to people. I heard books are a good thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, and I've done that largely because like I, it actually really helps me become a better contributor to businesses, you know, like by articulating my own thoughts, I realize some of them are wrong, you know, and then that allows me to improve that reasoning and articulation so that I can then help the founders more. And then the third part is, well, you know, I'm like regularly, you know, trying to like found new companies or get involved in, in, in new companies or whatever, you know, kind of at the early stage, I'm, I'm literally, I'm literally going through setting up a new company today. I started setting up a new company and then purely being like, I wonder if this will work. Yeah. Because if I want to be able to do stuff to, uh, you know, create impact or or add impact to other people's lives, you know, as like customers or more broadly the world, whatever that impact might be is irrelevant. Um, well, I kind of got to try stuff. So like for me, like I'm constantly doing this like experimentation, you know, what, what can I do that's going to work? What's going to stick? You know, can you share what the new company is? Not yet. (laughs) No, no. No. We have to read about it in the app. Yeah, that's right. Um, reflecting back now on the journey mm. and knowing what you know now like mm. y- you said if you started sweat today doing the same things probably mm. wouldn't be as successful yeah um for for people who are listening who are you know similar age to what you mm. were when you started the company whatever whatever industry they're, they're wanting to to start in like mm. what are some of the big the big learnings that you had over the journey mm. that maybe you didn't realize at the time but realize now like oh fuck that was yeah. a, a key yeah you know decision that i made that yeah. led me on the path Yes, there's lots of things. And yeah, I, I mean, I could be here a long time with this, but maybe I'll just kind of communicate a couple of interesting ones to stimulate mm. some thought, right? Um, if you're in a journey where, you know, you're kind of running a business and you're getting good feedback from your customers and from the market, in other words, like it's working in inverted commas for all intents and purposes, um, that can be a really dangerous position to take advice from other people, right? And that's a really like controversial statement in itself, right? And what I mean by that is like, do not go to an accountant and ask for strategic advice on your business. Do not go to a lawyer and ask for investing advice. Like, you know, and I don't mean that in the sense that no accountant knows business and that no lawyer knows investing or whatever, but more often than not, they're actually not even going to understand what you're doing. Mm. So 
message there is you know don't rely on people to give you advice that's not directly in their subject matter field and as i said earlier even sometimes asking for advice in their subject matter field can be risky um i would suggest you know kind of like reframing that as a positive i would say well you know what go and find somebody who's either done what you've done you know or done something very similar or has done a combination of things that makes you go that person must be really good at solving these problems and ask them and learn from them instead um, because the wrong advice can waste you a lot of time and cost you a lot of money. Like I literally have a client at the moment who, uh, you know, had two options for her business model was her business was killing it. You had two options, kind of stay with her current business model or, you know, go try another one goes off and tries another one at the advice of one of her very experienced 20 years of advi- of business advisory experience. Then it almost destroyed her company in 12 months. Wow. Purely. And, and anyone who knew anything about her business model would have been like, that's a bad idea like straight up without even knowing any of the details just looking at the the headline brief would have known it was a bad idea but unfortunately got wooed into taking advice you know from from someone who is a experienced advisor qualified to take the advice right yeah right but not qualified to the right things you know so, so and on that how would you know like for someone who's starting off like it's probably not going to be millions of dollars worth of revenue that's going to give them the signs like hey this is working yeah you know? but like how yeah. how would someone know whether their idea or whether what they're doing is actually working like what would be the signs of traction yeah yeah, so try to collect objective data. Um, so in other words, like, you know, there's a really common kind of, you know, story. Everyone goes like, oh, I came up with this idea for a product. You know, so I built it and got a website and whatever. But I was like, show my mom and my dad and my brother. And they all thought it was shit. It's like, are you trying to sell to your mom and dad or brother? You know, like, number one. Number two, are they biased? Yes. You know, so like, I always believe like to figure out if you're actually succeeding at something, figure out, well, how do you measure success? And then how do you collect unbiased objective data mm. on that? Um, that's a pre- And again, it's easy to say that now because I understand what that means, you know, and I've been there and kind of gone through that. But, you know, like if you can't, if you can't answer a question, you either don't understand the question or don't have the data, you know, to answer it. Right. And more often than not, people are just looking at the wrong information. Like again, in that example, it's like your mum's feedback, or your dad's feedback, largely like for the large part, unless they're the exact customer and they're very intelligent and very mature and very objective and can get themselves to be very unbiased, it's probably not that good information or mm. data. And that sounds really kind of like blunt or savage, but the reality is it's, it's the true. truth, right? Yeah. yeah like, and this is one of the overarching themes in business, right? Like business doesn't really care that much about how you feel. And true. that's also a kind of blunt statement to make, yeah. but it's like your business doesn't really have feelings. Your business doesn't really care. Like, you know, your business is a machine the market will determine whether it's going to work yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for because one of the things is obviously resilience and people always talk mm. about, you know, just continue to show up, continue mm. to show up and, mm-hmm. you know, it'll work. But like how long someone's out there, you know, hustling and, and, and they're making some money, but mm. it's just enough to get by. Like how long do you mm. know, you know, yeah, maybe it's time to, to go. Like for you, if you were to look back and say like yeah. the, the app, for example, didn't get the traction that mm. it would have gotten and probably mm. a hard question to answer. How long do you reckon you would have persisted with it? If you're like, fuck, this mm. got to work. This has to work. This has to work. Because yeah. in your head, you were like, this is the right decision. But if the market yeah. determined, maybe it wasn't. Look, it's a, it's an interesting question. And, it, and it's quite a sad question as well. Like, you know, I mean, I, I attended quite a few like, you know, pitch nights and been to like networking events and met lots of founders and whatever. And you know, in, in many cases, like I listen to them, talk to them and I kind of go, I can't predict the future but based of the information I have available to me and my approach to thinking and my experience in the space, there's a very low probability that that's going to work. Mm. Like, and that's a really sad reality. And this happens to a lot of people who end up, you know, focusing on the same thing for years. Uh, <laughs> honestly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always, I always preface this with, you know, look, lovely to meet you, et cetera, et cetera. This is just my opinion based off my experience, but based on this approach to thinking about business and based on these variables and these inputs, the probability that you'll succeed is going to be incredibly low. And even mm. if you do succeed, the probability that it'll be significant will be even lower again. Yeah. So, and more often than not, that's met positively. Like they appreciate that. Like I, I actually was working, you know, provided some advice to a person um, in Adelaide recently, you know, who I provided a pretty direct opinion similar to that on. Um, and then, you know, over the six to eight week period after we caught up, they revolutionized the entire way to approach the business and now they're winning yeah so that was what they needed at that mm. point in time it doesn't make me right like and this is the interesting thing too like your question like well how long should you persist well well it depends and this is normally my answer to everything in business like it depends well it depends on you know do you actually have any reason to think that you will succeed 
you know, it depends on what else is happening in your life and what is your lifestyle. Need. Like a great example would be maybe you're sitting on top of an amazing opportunity and maybe you just can't make it work, but everything indicates that it's going to be awesome and it's going to be massive, but you can't afford to put food on the table for your children. Like, does it matter how good the business opportunity is? I'd probably choose getting a job and feeding my children. Yeah, that would be what I, that would be what I would choose. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, if you didn't have kids and you were not able to put food on the table for yourself, you might stick through it. You might find a way, like get your friends to feed you, like whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know, right? Like, but there's been lots of extreme scenarios where there's so many reasons why people should have given up. You know, the creator of Slack, I don't know if anyone you know, knows the Slack story as well. It's like, that was a gaming company. They were building games. They'd burned through, I think from memory, it was like tens of millions of dollars in the US. They just randomly built that internal well, talk. Yeah they, chat. They, yeah, they had a chat tool for players in the platform. They then used it internally. That was great. And I can't even remember what the stimulus was, but there was some interesting stimulus to see if they could you know, get other companies to buy it. And then off they went. And now it's tens of billions of dollars in equity value. Mm. Like, So the notion of like persistence and, and like at what point in time do you draw the line is an incredibly complex you know, answer. But I would say it depends is the answer. And it, you need to, like for someone who's in that position, I think the right question is not should I continue? It should be under which circumstances should I not? Mm. Yeah, because everyone's situation will be different. Yeah, so maybe it's family or whatever it's it is. It's a good way to put it, yeah. Mm. Yeah. What are, what are some other big... Uh, so that one was obviously around um, you know, making sure you're taking advice from the people that you should be taking advice yeah. from. Yeah, I think, yeah, getting good advice is important. Um, yeah. I think... Uh, I think as well, and you, I talk about this all the time and a lot of people, when I raise it with them, they kind of go like, what does that even mean? And I'm like, that's the point. Um, but you know, like I think learning, learning and focusing on learning you know, better and more efficient and effective ways to think is a critical skill as well. And that sounds, uh, as I said, like it sounds a little kind of weird or abstract, but it's like the quality of your business outcomes is directly going to relate to the quality of your judgments and decisions. Mm. That, that that is a cut through like super simple statement right people will do better in things at life and business included if they can make better decisions so therefore focusing on your capacity and capability to make good decisions seems like a pretty good area to invest time in you know like so what are your mental models like what are the first principles of your business etc cetera, etc cetera. like not a lot of people actually can answer those questions they don't actually know so you know, if I could go back in time, like, and this wasn't something that I consciously stumbled upon until I was well and truly through my journey, but you know, how do you think and how do you solve problems? Like it's, it is such a valuable skill and something that's not, at least in my, with my awareness, as far as, far as I understand the education system, it's not something that's actually spoken about or taught, but it's like, it's an incredibly large amount of value. Mm. Um, and then off the back of that, like when you're understanding how you're thinking and how you're solving problems, I think the next thing that comes to my mind is, well, how are you feeling? You know, like, and what are you doing for your emotions, like to regulate your emotions and to become more aware and, you know, kind of more um, skilled at regulating your emotions. Because like business, business in general, and coming back to the advisor comments, like it's unstable, it's uncertain, it's higher risk, it's unpredictable. Yeah, it's all of these bad, 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 you know, mm -hmm. like scary, scary, scary things, right? It's like, so make better decisions, make them faster and find a way to emotionally survive on the way through and how how did you do that was it reading was it yeah was it... yeah so my, my, my experience was kind of a combination of like reading a lot um very painfully learning that i had the wrong advisors and the wrong people trying to find the right people and the right advisors and then just like immersing myself you know in that environment um what one of the headline statements i say to people that i work with very often um they're like oh yeah i got all these problems to solve i'm not sure how to solve them i'm like well I'm like, I don't want to make you feel small and I don't want to degrade your scenario, but none of the problems that you're solving have not yet already been solved by somebody. Like in business, 99% or more of the issues that you need to solve have already been resolved by somebody. And purely by virtue of that, it's like, well, who solved it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then off you go. It's like, I, I founded a marketplace business about four years ago. Um, we're about to go to market and raise uh, about $10 million for it. It's, it's doing good. Um, you know, it's, it's chugging along nicely. It's very complicated, you know, business in some regard. There's a lot to learn about it. And um, what's it a marketplace for? Uh, licensing. So, right. like, basically, uh, you know, we took a peer to peer, you know, marketplace uh, approach to the licensing industry. So, biggest driving school in Australia has got somewhere between 30 and 40 instructors, depending on how you kind of class that. We've got like 800 or more than 800 here, but they wow. don't work for us. You know, they're just a part of our peer to peer platform. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of process like, you know, 20, $30 million worth of like licensing transactions this year, but we don't actually like touch anything if that makes sense. Anyway, yeah. long story short, we do that. And I'm like, well, that's a business model. Like at the beginning, I'm like, I'm not familiar with this business model. So 
where like how do I learn about that? I'm like, oh well, I know this finance analyst that built this model for this guy, so I'll go and ask him some questions. Oh yeah, and I know the guy that did this at Uber for Australia, and oh yeah, that guy worked on you know this peer to peer platform here, so I just go and meet with them and talk to them, and you know because it's specific learning. Yeah, someone's so, been there and done it, like yeah. you're saying, right? Advice from the people who yeah, correct, are qualified. So, yeah, like and you know, and that that, that <laughs> business actually in itself is a fascinating example of the whole thing around advice before. For two years, we argued with like the accounting team that the accounting principles and protocols didn't actually suit the business model and that they were wrong. Two years, only to arrive at the answer that we were right. <laughs> you know, like, and this is the thing. It's like, and this is, you know, we were working with a team that have got collectively more than 30 years of experience in accounting. Yeah, wow. So like, and, and that's like, I'm doing, like was helping to drive that. And I have some experience in this. Mm. Like, so imagine the amount of time and energy that is lost in businesses in general, unfortunately, you know, by having the wrong people or not being able to solve problems the right way or, or whatever it is, right? And, and something you said there around like, okay, I'll go and speak to that person because I know mm. they've done that and I'll go and speak to that person. Mm. Like, that's obviously a network, right? Like Sort of, the- like, man, like, it's so funny you say that because a lot of people say like, oh, it's a great network. It's like, dude, do you have any idea how many people, like when I, had, no one knew what sweat was, like no one knew what it was. Like I literally would just send like tens or hundreds of like random DMs on Instagram. That's how, like, I, that's how I got you on the ran, Yeah, podcast. yeah, like random LinkedIn things, yeah. right? Like, and I still do that today. And guess what? I get rejected a shitload. Hmm. get left on red like that's enraging sometimes <laughs> but like <laughs> yeah but i'm like come on man but like yeah so how do you it, usually it reach happens. out to people again selfish question is it usually through linkedin or your email? insta or dm or email like yeah, right. i've also you know kind of because uh, over time i have built a network now some of these things are easier i'm like oh this person knows that one so i'll reach Get out to them there sort of yeah, yeah it's right. kind of you know um second degree connection type stuff but but like you said you wouldn't have had that when you started and then over time you've obviously built a network so how yeah. important do you feel like that is i know for myself like mm. the only reason i've done half the stuff i've done is because of the people you know and then yeah you just happen to fall into things or happen to get introduced yeah. to the right person yeah i think um yeah like building a network is great i think um a more important thing to accept is that you need to be willing to do the embarrassing and boring shit to build a network, mm. right? Because everyone goes like, I'm going to build my network. I'm going to go to this event. It's like, but is that actually the most effective thing you need to do? Or are you avoiding doing the embarrassing things like cold calls and like cold outreaches and whatever? Because like, that's the stuff you have to do. Like, you know, imagine being a real estate agent who doesn't want to do a cold call. Yeah, wouldn't work. is isn't going to work, right? But like, for whatever reason, founders, um, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of founders, you know, have this kind of thing. It's like, oh, I don't want to get rejected. Mm. I don't want to outreach. Like I always, you know, tell the story. I'm like, man, I did, I did, well over 60 or 70 investor meetings in, in like one two week period and got rejected by 100 percent of them and i knew mm. like i knew along the way i was getting rejected by them so it wasn't like do 60 or 70 and then get a scorecard at the end it was like do one rejected do one rejected do one rejected and i went to every single one of those i tried with the same level of energy yeah because that's what's required yeah right yeah so coming back to your whole like persistence thing you know before like how long should wrong. you persist Obviously, these investors right well, maybe, right? Like maybe, who knows? But like it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. Like, right? do the embarrassing stuff. Mm. You know, do the stuff that you don't want to do. Like, I think as bad as it sounds, like, uh, and I, I kind of had some experience with this too. Is like founders spend a lot of time being in the driver's seat, being the alpha in the room, you know, the decision maker, the final, you know, shot caller or whatever, right? And that, in some ways, can become depending on your mindset can become quite intoxicating, mm. right? Because the more that you do that and the more you experience those things and you're like, oh, well, now my company's big, so I'm going to fly business class. I've and the suffered more that from you have that this, 100%. Yeah, you're like, oh, I, don't, I don't want to do the small shit anymore. I don't want to do the mundane The shit, shit. that actually got you. Yeah, I remember I, I would talk to anyone, like mm. fucking anyone. If yeah. soon as I wanted to talk to someone, I would just walk mm. up to them and be like, hey man, you know, yeah. this is what I do. This is who I am. Yeah. Harry Triggerboff to me is a guy who owns Meriton, yeah. one of the richest guys in trade. He's the yeah. biggest inspiration. So I went to an AFR event at the end of last year, a property event, walked out the front of the Hilton to get an mm. Uber back to the office and he happened to be standing mm. there, you know, and having, having an incredible year, building an awesome business. Yeah. I don't know what got in my head, but I wouldn't go and say hello to him because yeah. I, I felt like I was like too good or wasn't, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and that still plays on my mind right now because that one conversation could have changed the game, could have changed my life dramatically, you mm. know, and that's, Yep. something that fucks me up. that's very interesting that you said that very it's it's a, it's a real thing man like and coming back to the whole you know got some money in the bank account rah, 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 whatever it's like never ever forget that you had to do some pretty dumb unscalable <laughs> gross or embarrassing stuff to kind of get where you are you know like that's that's in some cases it's just necessary you know mm. which is why i always say i'm like just do what needs to be done 
So true. Like That's remove true. all the emotion, remove everything from just do what needs to be done. Like literally that company that I was talking about before, it's like I was like literally sending copy and paste like reach outs to some people from a particular type of company at the moment because I was trying to get in touch with them. Like eight out of 10 of them read it and didn't respond. <laughs> and I'm like, cool, another 10. You know, like yeah. you can't, you can't, you need to try to continue to go from like A to B to C to D without losing energy. It's very hard. Like I totally get it, but that's just what's needed. What, what needs to be done. Yeah. yeah. Last one before, before we wrap up, um, for, for growing the business, obviously your journey wasn't like a 40 year journey, right? Mm. It was probably like a 10 to 12 year compressed into like six or seven years. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, when you people grow companies, a lot of the time they're not as successful as you've been financially. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the time they just keep pushing all their money back into yep. to the company and they very rarely pull something off the table for themselves. And we see it all the time and trying to build people's portfolios is that, yeah. you know, they've waited such a long time to start building wealth. Yep. Do, what, what's your thoughts around, you know, you said you had tens of million dollars worth of assets mm. outside of the company. Mm. It sounds like you were buying property or were investing in mm. other stuff that mm. wasn't necessarily related just to your business. Yeah. So, which like, you know, in itself is an interesting, a whole other interesting topic of conversation. But, you know, I'd say, so my mentality early on was, and this was before the app, um, cool, like made 10, 20 million bucks, whatever it is. I'm like, holy crap, maybe we might not make any more money. Shit, deploy the capital. Mm. You know, like park it somewhere where it's like safe and we'll hopefully grow, you know, humbly grow along the side. Um, and then got to a point in time, I was like, oh, we're going to build the app okay, we can't take that money out because we have to reinvest it. So left all those assets out and then all the profit that the company made, we just, you know, put back into it. And so I kind of experienced both of the extreme ends of the spectrum, take all the money out and deploy it and then don't take any of the money out, just redeploy it. Mm. Um, And I think, again, the answer, you know, what's right or what is advised, it depends, you know, on a variety of different things. But more often than not, yeah, more often than not, people want to withdraw money or dividends or whatever out of their business for largely irrational you know needs in other words so one they're like i want to increase my lifestyle now it's like cool but there's not a lot of data to support that that is actually financially a wise idea at this point in time Mm -hmm. number one or number two they're like well i want to withdraw all these dividends because i want to take all the money out and invest in something safe like a term deposit or bonds or or the asx or s p whatever it is uh because you know that's uh safe and i can see it and touch it and and i know it's there but for a lot of people, and especially people who are earlier on in the journey and early not being represented by how much money and just early being represented by a bunch of different maturity characteristics of the organization, people who are early on in the journey, there is no there is no data to support that there's a lower risk, higher return, you know, uh, opportunity than their own business. Mm. Like more often than not, their own business is actually going to make the most sense. Um, they have the most control over it. It's more likely going to grow the most, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that's a... Uh, a like a principle or a suggestion, right? It's not a rule. Like that's not always the case, which is why I said it depends. Um, I I would, you know, try to simplify that right down to it's like, if you are doing it and taking money out of your business, it should only ever be under the right circumstances and the right conditions for the right reasons. Mm. I haven't seen that many people do it for the right reasons and the right circumstances and conditions. More often than not, it's flawed logic. driven by Lambo and a Rolex. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly right. Uh, That's interesting. Mate, that was fucking, there was a lot of gold in that, wasn't there? That was good. Oh, glad you liked it, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. No, happy to be here.